to the visit training session titled Utilizing Synthetic Imagery from the NSSL 4-Kilometer Wharf ARW Model in Forecasting Severe Thunderstorms. My name is Dan Bikus, Dan Lindsay, and others helped in developing this particular training session. This session is part of a series that focuses on applications of synthetic imagery from the NSSL 4-Kilometer Wharf ARW Model. In this training session, we'll consider applications of the synthetic imagery towards severe weather for forecasting. The primary motivation for looking at synthetic imagery is that you can see many processes in an integrated way compared with looking at numerous model fields and integrating them mentally. Synthetic imagery is model output that is displayed as though it is satellite imagery. Analyzing synthetic imagery has an advantage over model output fields in that the feature of interest appears similar to the way it would appear in satellite imagery. There are multiple sources of synthetic imagery available on the web. For example, the CRASS model at the University of Wisconsin has been available in AWIPS via the LDM for some time. The primary focus of this training session is synthetic imagery generated from the NSSL 4-kilometer WARF ARW model. The model is run once a day at 0Z. It uses WSM6 microphysics. This is a one-moment package, meaning the model predicts only the mass and not the number concentration of each hydrometeor species. Hydrometeors include cloud water, cloud ice, snow, grapple, and rain. Certain model output fields, including the hydrometeors, in addition to temperature, pressure, heights, water vapor, and canopy temperature, are sent to CIRA and SIMS. Those fields are used as inputs into a model that generates simulated satellite brightness temperatures. Gaseous absorption, by water vapor primarily, is calculated for cloud-free grid columns, and modified anomalous diffraction theory is used to obtain scattering and absorption by the cloud particles. Cloud water and cloud ice are the only hydrometeors having a non-negligible effect on the resulting brightness temperatures. Given the one-moment microphysics, particle number concentration must be guessed at. Since particle size is proportional to the ratio of the mass to the number concentration, the uncertainty in the number concentration leads to uncertainty in the particle size, which in turn leads to errors in the cloud optical depths. This is most often manifested by thin cirrus having brightness temperatures that are too cold. For more information about the details of the model, see the references on the student guide webpage. Hourly output is generated for the 9 to 36 hour forecast, valid 9Z of day 1 to 12Z of day 2. The synthetic imagery is ready to view by about 10Z. The model outputs brightness temperatures for a number of satellite bands. The bands are those that will appear on GOES-R since the project is based on demonstrated products that will be available on the GOES-R satellite scheduled for launch in 2016. The bands are very close to those found on the current GOES satellites, as you can see, so that the principles discussed in this training session readily apply to operational GOES satellites of the present. In this training session, we're only going to focus on the 10.35 micron IR band and two of the three available water vapor bands. We'll be discussing the water vapor channel you're used to looking at at 6.5 microns, and we'll also be looking at the 7.4 micron water vapor channel, which is currently available on the GOES sounder. Next, we'll look at the differences between these two water vapor channels. The weighting function profile gives us a clear indication of what level in the vertical the channel is seen. Here's the weighting function profile based on a sounding from North Platte, Nebraska for the 6.9 micron wavelength in green and the 7.3 micron wavelength in purple. The maximum values for the 6.9 micron channel are around 400 to 500 millibars. Think of this as the net temperature of the layer of moisture the channel sees peaks around 400 to 500 millibars with decreasing values above and below that layer. Let's contrast that with the 7.3 micron curve shown in purple, which sees the moisture at lower levels and over a broader depth. The advantage of looking at the 7.4 micron channel is detecting vertical motions through a deeper layer, as well as detection of mid-level jet streaks. Note that the, chan 
the layer the channel sees is variable and depends on the thermodynamic profile. We now begin looking at cases. We'll start each case by looking at the SBC storm reports. For this case from June 21, 2010, note the numerous severe weather reports across Wisconsin, Illinois, and Iowa, while further west we see numerous reports in Montana and Colorado. Here is the WARF ARW synthetic imagery for the 6.95 micron water vapor channel. This is from the 0Z 21 June model run. So we're looking at the 12 to 30 hour forecast during this loop as the imagery is labeled down here, 12Z to 6Z. Note the region of convection during the morning hours in Illinois moving towards Indiana. MCSs appear much smaller in the synthetic imagery compared to observations for reasons we'll discuss later. Note the darker region of warmer brightness temperatures right here that appears to be associated with a short wave. Convection develops in response to this short wave in the Iowa, Wisconsin, Illinois region from the afternoon hours and moves eastward through the evening. Further west, we see a cutoff low over western Montana. We see a jet streak that moves from Arizona to Colorado as depicted by a region of relatively fast moving area of cooler brightness temperatures. This visual comparison of a jet streak with how it would show up in the water vapor imagery makes comparison between model output and GOES imagery even easier. We can see convection develop in response to the cutoff low over Montana and further south across Colorado to the northern Texas panhandle in response to the jet streak. Visually, we can readily see the mid to upper level features in the synthetic imagery that can lead to convection, which makes for an easy comparison with water vapor imagery. Here is the GOES water vapor imagery for the same time period as the synthetic imagery we just looked at. First, note the morning MCS across Illinois moving into Indiana. Let me go ahead and circle that. That's this MCS right here as it moves into Indiana. Go ahead and restart the loop again. It does appear much larger in GOES compared to the synthetic imagery because the synthetic imagery typically underdoes the aerial extent of the anvil cirrus. MCSs will almost always appear too small in the synthetic imagery for this reason. Note in the GOES imagery that the MCS persists longer than the synthetic imagery showed. This is another common thing to look for in the synthetic imagery in that it is typically too quick to dissipate the convection. The model did a pretty good job with the convection associated with the short wave as it moved across Iowa, Wisconsin, and Illinois. In the west, we can readily identify the cutoff low in Montana and the convection associated with it. The model did a very good job with the jet streak that moved from Arizona into Colorado. Brightness temperatures in the synthetic imagery will typically be warmer than observed in GOES imagery, which is why we see the jet streak show up in the GOES imagery as a larger region of colder brightness temperatures. The storms associated with this jet streak have a much larger anvil cirrus than the synthetic imagery showed. This is a known bias, so you'll need to keep that in mind when identifying thunderstorms in the synthetic imagery. In review, we see some areas where the forecast convection timing and location look good. Other areas, not as good. Remember, we're looking at model output and not even considering low-level features such as visible imagery and surface observations. The main utility of the synthetic water vapor imagery is identifying shortwave and jet streaks that may play a role in the initiation, maintenance, and intensity of convection. Here's the WARF ARW synthetic IR imagery for the same time period. During the SPC spring experiment, the sector was over this region, so we'll be looking at the central U.S. for this reason. The advantage to this channel is that low-level features will show up. This is useful when analyzing cloud cover to see if clouds will dissipate and allow for sufficient insulation to warm up the surface. Note the morning cloud cover here in eastern Colorado that's forecast to dissipate by late morning. Another example over here is outflow boundaries. 
in northern Missouri, and these outflow boundaries show up as lighter or colder brightness temperatures. These kind of details are usually beyond the ability of the model to accurately represent. However, it's important to note their presence and what effect they might have in the near future in the model. Here's the GOES IR imagery for the same time period. The most obvious difference between the synthetic imagery and the GOES imagery is that the storms in the synthetic imagery appear smaller. That is, the cloud tops are not as cold as they should be, and more apparently, the aerial coverage of the colder cloud tops is underdone. Remember that the model will perform best regarding convection in situations with relatively strong synoptic forcing, such as short waves and jet streaks that become juxtaposed with low-level convergence boundaries. Note the model does relatively well with the convection in Illinois, Iowa, and Wisconsin, since it's associated with a short wave. Note the region of Cirrus associated with the jet streak mentioned before as it moves from Utah into Colorado, right here. The timing of that Cirrus as it becomes juxtaposed with a low-level convergence boundary near Denver seems to correspond quite well to convective initiation. Note the early cloud cover in eastern Colorado does dissipate as was forecast by the model. This is one utility of the synthetic IR imagery that you would not use the synthetic water vapor imagery for. Let's move on to the next case from May 12, 2010, and for this case we'll be looking at the Southern Plains. Here's the WARF ARW synthetic water vapor imagery. Note the representation of the MCS early on in Missouri, Iowa, Illinois, and Indiana. This is typical for the model and that there are many holes in the clouds compared to an MCS appearance in GOES imagery with its uniform canopy of cold cloud tops. The model shows a trough in the west so that there is strong southwest flow across the plains. The model develops afternoon convection in Iowa at the leading edge of a dark region of warmer brightness temperatures. Notice the extensive region of higher clouds that are forecast to develop in the southern plains. This can play a key role in where the model predicted thunderstorms will develop. Also notice this region in central Kansas where thunderstorms are forecast to develop. They're very difficult to see because they're very small here and they're also mixed in with some of those higher cirrus clouds. These small thunderstorms that you see like this are typical of the model, so at times it may be difficult to pick out on the imagery storms that are developing. So next, let's look at the zoomed in IR imagery to help us out. Here's the WARF ARW synthetic IR imagery for May 12th. Cloud coverage would definitely be a key forecast question here. Not only the high clouds that are forecast to develop over the southern plains, but also the low level clouds. The model has quite a bit of low clouds from central Kansas northward and high clouds south of there into Oklahoma. The model has thunderstorms developing in between those two regions along a boundary in central Kansas. Again, note how small they appear. I'll go ahead and circle those storms right here since they are difficult to pick out here. So again, don't expect large storms with extensive cirrus canopies in the model here. Quite often they're, they're quite small and they can be difficult to point out here. Note the long streaks associated with the high clouds here, down here in Texas and into Oklahoma. They don't appear natural. The long streaks of high clouds are optically thicker in the model than observed. Expect to see this fairly often when an analyzing what appear to be high-level clouds in the model. The best approach is to compare the GOES imagery with the forecast images during the morning to early afternoon hours. Note if the model appears to be doing well or not, and this will gauge how much confidence you should have in the synthetic imagery for the late afternoon and evening hours. Here's a comparison of the synthetic IR imagery versus the GOES IR imagery from 12Z through 18Z. Note the imagery around 12Z depicting the MCS over here versus the GOES imagery over here. In the same location as was forecast, 
but with a different appearance. Remember the model output MCSs will appear small and sometimes be full of holes in the canopy cirrus. The model does pick up on the high cloud cover development across Texas and Oklahoma by this time. And th the best thing to think of here is that the location of the cirrus is, is generally forecast pretty well by the model. What can be incorrect here, as we just pointed out in the previous slide, is these long streaks here. In other words, the optical thickness issues here. So in terms of the thickness here, that's something um, that you wouldn't want to interpret literally here. But the location of the cirrus is generally uh, pretty good in the forecast. Now let's look at the low clouds here. The model has a good handle on the low cloud cover across Kansas. Next, let's look at the higher resolution goes visible imagery. Here's the corresponding goes visible imagery through 1730 UTC. There is clearing in the warm sector south of the coal front in Kansas, so confidence in thunderstorms developing in that region should increase. Further south in Oklahoma, the cirrus can be seen developing in Texas and advecting towards Oklahoma. However, there is a region in western Oklahoma along a dry line right here that appears it will not be impacted by the cirrus. Here's the corresponding GOES visible imagery after 1730 UTC. The model did pretty well with the area of clearing that developed in central Kansas, where thunderstorms initiated along a cold front, and north of the Sierra Shield. Recall the model did not have convection further south in Oklahoma, but by monitoring trends in the IR and visible imagery, we can gain confidence in convective initiation near the dry line in Oklahoma, as insulation did indeed occur there. For our next case, we'll move to August 4th of 2010, and we'll be looking at this region right here where there were numerous severe wind reports. Here's the Wharf ARW synthetic water vapor imagery, and the first thing I'm going to do is stop it at a particular time and note the convection that is developing right here in Ohio. It appears to originate just north of a dark zone of warmer brightness temperatures along a line of higher clouds. And this could be from an earlier MCS across Illinois that the model dissipated too quickly by this time here. The model forecast convection in Ohio moves to the southeast, experiences upscale growth, and merges with convection along a line in Kentucky into West Virginia. The convection continues to move southeast towards Virginia and is then forecast to dissipate. Here's the corresponding GOES water vapor imagery. We look further back to 4Z through the overnight hours to see that there was an MCS over Illinois around 11Z. I'll go ahead and stop that around 11Z. And you can see here's the MCS of interest, moves towards the east, and convection develops in response to that MCS from uh, earlier hours here. And then we get pretty much a, a pretty similar solution to what we just saw in the synthetic imagery. Our next case is from May 19, 2010, and we'll be looking over Oklahoma. The Wharf ARW synthetic water vapor imagery shows an elongated trough centered around Colorado and Wyoming. Note the dark region of warmer brightness temperatures that appears to be a shortwave rotating around the trough from New Mexico moving towards the Texas Panhandle, followed by western Oklahoma. The model develops convection in response to this short wave in Oklahoma. Here's the corresponding GOES water vapor imagery, which shows a good agreement with the model in initiating storms along the leading edge of the short wave. 
Here's the Wharf ARW 7.34 micron synthetic imagery. This band has a weighting function that peaks lower in the atmosphere than the 6.95 micron band we just looked at, usually around 600 millibars or so. This band can give us indications of mid-level jets, and since we're looking lower into the atmosphere, may provide details about the characteristics of the environment associated with the dark region of warmer brightness temperatures. There is a well-defined dark zone at the southern end of the trough, right here, that moves eastward and expands during the day. Convective initiation occurs at the leading edge of this dark zone of warmer brightness temperatures during the afternoon in Oklahoma, right here. Here's the corresponding GOES Sounder 7.4 micron imagery. The resolution is greater than 10 kilometers, which is more coarse than the water vapor imagery that you're used to looking at, and more also more coarse than the synthetic imagery that we're, we just looked at in the previous slide. Remember that in general, the synthetic imagery has warmer brightness temperatures than observed on GOES. This actually makes it easier to identify the dark region of warmer brightness temperatures in the synthetic imagery. Then we can go to the GOES imagery and identify it there. In this example, convection develops along the leading edge of the dark zone of warmer brightness temperatures in Oklahoma, very similar to the depiction in the synthetic imagery. It's important to understand what you're looking at in the imagery when you see a dark zone of warmer brightness temperatures. Next, we'll look at that in more detail. Here's the visible imagery with the surface observations shortly before convective initiation. The key boundaries here are an outflow boundary and an approaching cold front. The afternoon convection develops along these boundaries and where the leading edge of the dark zone of warmer brightness temperatures that we just looked at in the 7.4 micron channel exists. Now let's look at the sounding from Amarillo, Texas. This is the 12Z sounding before the passage of the dark zone of warmer brightness temperatures and after it's gone through. Let me make a note of the 500 millibar temperatures right here before and after. And you can see the lapse rates have steepened here. The mid-level lapse rates have steepened and we have these uh, cooler temperatures that have come in aloft. And this is one of the key ingredients for destabilization, which would likely explain the dark zone's role in assisting in convective initiation and maintenance as well. Our next case is from June 25th of 2010, and we'll focus on southern Minnesota. Here's the Wharf ARW synthetic water vapor imagery for June 25th. A ridge is located over the southeast to south central U.S. with a trough to the west, so the strongest flow is north of the ridge, which is situated across the northern plains in Minnesota. There are indications of an early MCS in Minnesota. Remember, it will appear much less obvious in the synthetic imagery compared to the GOES imagery. The model develops what appears to be intense convection later in the afternoon in the wake of the MCS, and we say intense here because we see a relatively large area of cold cloud tops in the anvil cirrus, along with a dark zone signature in the forecast imagery. And what I mean by that is we see a storm go up right here. And in the vicinity of the storm, we see these warmer brightness temperatures develop. And that's induced by the storm itself. Those are first reported by Elrod in uh, late 1980s in a journal article, and these were associated with strong subsidence that you get in the vicinity of strong updrafts. Here's the corresponding GOES water vapor imagery. We see a relatively good forecast in that there was a morning MCS, convection developed in the wake of the MCS, and appeared quite intense in the GOES water vapor imagery as well with a noticeable dark zone signature induced by the storm caused by compensating subsidence in the vicinity of a strong updraft. 
Here's the Wharf ARW synthetic IR imagery for the same time period. The morning MCS in southern Minnesota leaves behind a boundary of low-level clouds, or cooler brightness temperatures, that is east to west oriented and appears to be an outflow boundary. This can be compared with visible imagery during the late morning to early afternoon hours to see if this is evolving similar to the way the model forecasts. Thunderstorms are forecast to develop along the MCS boundary during the afternoon hours, so let's advance forward to that time right here. And if we go a little bit later, we see the signature of an enhanced V on this particular storm right here. The thunderstorm activity continues through the evening hours as they move southeast towards Iowa. Here is the corresponding GOES IR imagery. This would be considered a successful forecast of an early MCS in Minnesota with later convective development along the MCS outflow boundary. Convective initiation occurs between 20 and 21Z as the model predicted. The storms did appear quite intense. Recall there were a number of tornado reports. We also observed an enhanced V signature in the GOES imagery as was also depicted in the synthetic imagery. Cases such as this show the potential of utilizing synthetic imagery in forecasting. Just keep in mind that not every case will be forecast this well as we're looking at model output with its familiar limitations. Our next case is from June 20th, 2010. We'll be focusing on this area and looking at cloud coverage trends. Here's the Wharf ARW synthetic water vapor imagery which shows an upper low over Oregon with a strong jet to its southeast from Utah to Wyoming to Montana. The model has quite a bit of convection from Montana southward into the plains. The earliest convection occurs in Montana where strong forcing near the upper low exists. Storms in Wyoming and northeast Colorado seem to be associated with the upper level jet moving through the region. Here's the Wharf ARW synthetic IR imagery. Note the low-level clouds at 14Z in Nebraska. Go ahead and point those out right here. And they extend into northeast Colorado. There's also some low-level clouds here in Wyoming. Both of these areas of low-level clouds are forecast to dissipate, leading to afternoon insulation, then followed by convection later in the day. There is an additional complicating factor in this region right here where higher clouds are forecast to develop across this region and then go away later in the day. Across Iowa, an early MCS moves east. There's clearing behind the MCS and later convective initiation occurs near Omaha. Here's the corresponding GOES IR imagery. Note that the majority of the low-level clouds in Wyoming dissipate leading to clearing and isolated afternoon storms. In northeast Colorado, the low-level clouds look much more widespread than forecast, pushing all the way to the front range. Thus, the lack of insulation appears to be responsible for the lack of thunderstorms in this region. Further east in Iowa, we see considerable cloud cover and additional convection during the day. Thunderstorms do initiate in the area as the model forecasted. Here's the corresponding GOES visible imagery. The visible imagery can be monitored to check to see if cloud coverage trends forecast by the model are taking place. For example, in this case, the low-level clouds across northeast Colorado are covering a larger area than forecast and are not dissipating during the day. This played a key role in limiting the insulation and thus thunderstorm development probabilities. Synthetic imagery from model output is becoming more popular so that we're seeing a greater number of models producing synthetic imagery. The operational 4-kilometer NAM nest synthetic imagery is also available for viewing. There are some differences between the NAM nest and the Nissel Wharf ARW, as you can see in this slide here. The NAM nest synthetic imagery is currently available from the 0Z run with output available from 0Z through the 60-hour forecast. The output is hourly through 36 hours and three hourly thereafter out to 60 hours. 
the synthetic imagery early in the forecast period will appear more smooth since it's a reflection of the model's spin-up period. That's particularly true in the water vapor band that we'll look at. The band being simulated in the NAM nest is 6.5 microns rather than 6.95 microns. This corresponds to the water vapor band on the current GO satellite. Remember, 6.5 microns is sensing slightly further up in the atmosphere, so that brightness temperatures will appear slightly cooler than that from 6.95 microns. One of the key differences between the two models is the different microphysics packages. The NAM nest makes use of the Farrier scheme, whereas the Nissel Wharf ARW makes use of the WSM-6 scheme. Because of this, the biases we discussed earlier regarding thunderstorms appearing too small and anvil cirrus coverage appearing too small and sometimes full of holes will not apply. We found that the aerial coverage of cloud cover associated with thunderstorms tends to be either closer to reality or even slightly overdone in the NAM nest compared to the GOES imagery. As you gain experience in looking at synthetic imagery between different models, you'll notice these differences, primarily a consequence of different microphysics packages being used, and may develop preferences. The synthetic imagery from both of these models is available at the URL uh, given right here and also via AWIPS. Next, we'll compare the synthetic imagery from these two models for a particular event. In this case, from 29 March 2013, the IR synthetic imagery from the Nissel Wharf ARW is on the left, while the NAM nest is on the right, excluding the differences due to being two different model forecasts. Note the cloud cover associated with the thunderstorms are generally greater in the NAM nest compared with the Nissel Wharf ARW. Keep these differences in mind, and of course, remember to view simulated radar reflectivity as well to assess forecast convection. Here's the same time period as the previous slide, except here the NAM nest forecast is on the left with the corresponding GOES imagery on the right. The NAM nest does not underestimate the anvil cirrus on thunderstorms like the Nissel Wharf ARW does due to the different microphysics package being used. Keep in mind this doesn't necessarily mean one model forecast is better than the other. Where can you view the synthetic imagery? The Wharf ARW imagery we've been showing as part of the Gozar Proving Ground products that are available in AWIPS via the LDM. And if you're interested in those, let us know. We have our contact slide at the end here. The imagery is available on the web also at the CIRA website. Select the synthetic imagery from the suite of other Gozar Proving Ground products. SIMS also makes the imagery available at the URL shown here. Finally, if you're interested in the model output fields from the Wharf ARW model, it's available right here. Here's a summary of the things to remember when looking at the synthetic imagery for severe weather forecasting. Synthetic imagery from the Wharf ARW is best used in the morning to evaluate model performance. Clear sky brightness temperatures in the water vapor bands, 6.95 and 7.34 micron, are generally warmer than those in GOES. Thunderstorms will generally appear too small in the synthetic imagery. MCSs in the synthetic imagery are often full of holes and vastly underdone in terms of the aerial extent of the anvil cirrus. The model performs better when in an environment of strong synoptic forcing. The model is typically too quick to dissipate convection. For storm intensity, synthetic imagery may provide some value, but it's best to use a blend of the simulated radar reflectivity, synthetic imagery, and environmental data. The main role of the synthetic water vapor imagery is identifying short waves and jet streaks that may play a role in the initiation, maintenance, and intensity of convection. Synthetic IR imagery can be useful for cloud coverage forecasts, so check trends during the day. That concludes this training session. If you have any comments or questions, you can send me an email or Dan Lindsay. If you're taking this through the LMS, remember to complete the quiz afterwards so that you'll get credit for this training session.